a Canadian Radio Sanctuary podcast. How are things in Banff? Banff is lovely. It's, uh, it's a very nice day, and uh, we're in the, the famous Banff Springs Hotel, um, surrounded by some of the most extraordinary scenery. Yes, it is a beautiful setting there. Lake Louise and that whole area is very beautiful. Oh, yeah. Does it inspire you to write? <laughs> <laughs> it inspires me to uh, certainly recover from my jet lag. I just flew in from yesterday from Dublin, and uh, we're here with the band. We're going through rehearsals, um, although, tell the truth, I, I think everybody really wants to go skiing because we've just finished a 50-day European tour about three weeks ago, so everybody's feeling kind of hot and restless. Oh, I see. <laughs> How was the tour generally? The tour in Europe was sensational for us. It was Everything was sold out. We played eight different European countries, and the new record, The Getaway, was a great success in a lot of them, including in West Germany, where it went to number one in that chart. Mm-hmm. Very exciting. It is a very uh, lively album. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the producer, Rupert Hine? He's a, a well-known artist in his own right. Yes, Rupert Hine is an artist on the same label as myself, A&M Records, and I met him in Stockholm uh, last year. Uh, he came to a concert of ours, and although I heard his records, I didn't really feel he was the right kind of producer for me, and although I thought Immunity, his first record, was uh, an extraordinary piece of production, I loved it. And but as a human being, he's a lovely man, and uh, he called me up about three months later with a suggestion that he should record with me um, for the getaway, and immediately I agreed. Um, and working with him, he is one of the best synthesizer players and somebody who totally understands the synthesizer in the world. I'm quite sure that uh, a lot of the new wave bands see Rupert Hine as being one of the, their heroes. And working with him was terrific, and I really enjoyed it, and we're going to work again on the next album. Some of the stories behind the songs, for example, Don't Pay the Ferryman. Don't Pay the Ferryman. Well, that was just a little idea. As you probably know, if you're familiar with my work, I like to um, create a bit of suspense, a bit of drama, uh, tell a story and paint pictures. And this particular song, although it doesn't have any kind of resolution, um, I wanted to create the idea of a man hurtling towards his destiny. And it doesn't have any particular parallel with me, but I think everybody has something that they feel they have to do. And this particular man has to cross this river it's his symbol, and uh, I like to create the pictures of the things that he sees, and he has the whole image burned into his mind of the place that he is arriving at. And the trick about the ferryman is he may or may not be the man who ferries the dead across the river Styx, but uh, he is a man that is a threat to our hero. And the thing about it is he can't pay this ferryman until he gets across to the other side because... The ferryman has a habit of cutting the throat of his uh, passengers and throwing them in the river before they get there. So this is the thing. He, although at the end of the song, we don't know if he's arrived or not, but uh, I just, as I say, wanted to create a feeling of suspense and drama. What of uh, the getaway, the title, and the uh, cover that ties in with the runner? Yeah, it's a movement from, on the front cover, it's a movement from the dark stormy seas crossing an invisible line into peaceful waters and um, the getaway itself is it's a song I suppose that makes me feel good because I'd love to get all the world leaders together and, and chuck them in a room and throw away the key and tell them to work out their problems because at the moment the leaders are you know saying that the war is going to happen if this doesn't happen and you and I are sitting there waiting uh, for the result of this particular judgment, I'd love to get all the politicians and say, listen, will you wake up to the fact that, that there are other people involved here, namely the general public? Mm-hmm. Although it's just a bit of a dream, it's an idea of, of, I feel at times that, especially in Europe, we're being held hostage by all these uh, politicians. So it's a tongue-in-cheek look at, uh, wouldn't it be great to, to escape and uh, leave these people behind to work out the problems? Indirectly, you had a similar theme and message with Eastern Wind. Eastern Wind was more of a lyrical attempt to combine, I think, more what was happening in Iran uh, two years ago with the image of a farmer waiting for a storm to come and devastate his crops. 
again, that's a feeling of something about to happen. And the farmer himself was saying, well, if it does happen, I'm going to fight down to the very end. You see, I'm not a specifically political person, but I do like to broadly look at universal themes uh, from the standpoint of a lot of people who do listen to, to these songs. And although, to tell the truth, the, I probably appeal to more people around the world who don't speak English than who do. And they seem to pick up on these ideas. That's interesting. Hmm. What of the song, The Revolution? Well, with The Revolution, it's nowhere specific. I did, in my mind, set it initially in Ireland because I know a lot about the Irish history. But I wanted to create a song that worked like a film in four parts. And I, I sat down, and after I had an initial idea, I just closed my eyes and sort of watched the movie. I sat at home and watched it free, you know, and I, I worked out the song around it. Um, it's a piece that I, uh, I enjoy writing that kind of a uh, story. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no solution and there's no message in particular. Again, it's, as a songwriter, I was really interested in creating a story like that. And curiously enough, a lot of countries, people in Poland, where this record is very popular, they, they feel that this is a song for them, you know, which is very curious. Mm, that's interesting, yeah. So you have a following, needless to say, then, in Poland. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a following which is pretty restricted mm -hmm. by the, um, the Soviet uh, heavy hand, but I have a friend who is frequently in and out of the place, and he says this is one of the most popular records in the country. And um, I suppose in the last two or three years, I think, around the world, people have become more interested in words, in, in uh, songs, especially in politically uh, kept down places, p people who are held down. And in Poland, uh, it is an interesting thing that they've picked up on the... They seem to speak a lot of English over there. They've picked up on, on the getaway as an album and have applied it to their own thing. You can touch upon a number of songs on this album and place it in that same light. Uh, Liberty, for example. Right, right. The lyrics are uh, are basically simple, and but yet they say it all. And, and the reference to the time will come when it will change again, never forget. Well, I think at the end of the song, it's, it's one of those things that every, if you look at the French Revolution, what happened there was there was a, a tremendous overthrow, and the overthrow worked. But as in all revolutions, what happens is you, the people who, who uh, engineer them don't really think too far ahead because it usually changes again within a decade or, or 20 years. But as I, as I must point out, I'm, I'm more interested in the, the filmic aspect of songwriting rather than putting across any particular kind of uh, point of view. Have you ever done or been approached to do movie music? I have. I've, I've already had uh, songs in uh, several feature films, and uh, I've been approached several times to, to write songs for, uh, you know, as a title track for films. For one reason or another, it hasn't come through. But we're working on various projects. I'd love to, for example, make a movie of Spanish Train. Um, and we've made several movies down the years of Crusader and more recently of Don't Pay the Ferryman. And it's, it's so nice to see the ideas that I had in my mind actually coming up on, on screen. Mm -hmm. So I think this is something that I will become more and more involved in. It's interesting when you look over your albums, your your references to almost uh, a biblical theme in many ways. Uh, uh, even in the song Don't Pay the Ferryman, the, the thought of uh, crossing the river, perhaps the, the symbol of evil there could be the devil himself. In songs such as, uh, even though it was about television, but the devil's eye, and a spaceman came traveling, reference to uh, the story of Jesus, if you will, or, or someone such as Jesus. What are your feelings deep down when you do write? Do you intentionally want to write about uh, this theme, the devil versus God, this sort of thing? Well, not, not intentionally. You see, I believe that most people who create anything, really art or whatever, or music, they are pulling from the wellsprings of their own experience, especially in their early years. And obviously what I was interested in in my early years was... Um, spiritual things, mythological things, historical things, as well as romantic things. Um, 
not to the point where I was ever particularly interested in religion, modern religion at all. And that's the, it's for the individual, and, and I don't agree with a lot of, for example, the, the, the Catholic Church. These things are so personal, I wouldn't ever get involved in them on this kind of level. But obviously what I'm turning up within my music and my lyrics are things that please me inside, and uh, I enjoy very much the kind of the, the mystical. Uh, I suppose one of the reasons of living in Ireland is that it is a very mystical country, and it's, it's very hard to ignore it or um, avoid it in that place. And I enjoy working that into song. Now, you live in Dublin. Did you actually grow up there? No, I grew up in various countries, in South America, in Africa, in England, and um, more recently I, I was brought up in an old castle in the south of Ireland, um, about 100 miles south of where I'm living now. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, going back to what I was saying about the uh, almost a biblical feel, it's, it's an interesting and a unique mix of old stories made contemporary with contemporary music. I suppose you could say that, yes it is. Um, although more recently I find myself uh, looking at modern times much more, I think I started pulling away after the Crusader album, I felt that it was time to start pay more attention to what is happening today and uh, even tomorrow, and I, I think, I find that very satisfying to, to communicate my feelings about uh, what's happening today, as well as being able to, I suppose it's fairly unique to, um, to a lot of songwriters today to, to actually start working in historical themes. I know Al Stewart does it, but there's very few other people who do it, and I don't particularly do it because I want to be unique in that respect, but it's something that I enjoy. You write songs from the heart. That's the way uh, I know many of us look at it. I think you're right. A song on the new album called Borderline is a song from the heart. It's, I have no idea where it particularly came from, but it was definitely, there's an anti-war theme in there, a very strong one for me, and the way that individuals suffer in a war, especially lovers, families. I don't know if anyone has ever said this to you before, but... There are some similarities. You and Murray Head uh, seem to ring a similar bell in my mind. Yes, you know, I, I know him. Um, I mean, I, you sound different. I'm not saying that you sound the same, but your writing style uh, touches on some of the same areas. Well, I think you're right there. He, although I, I know very little about him, he recently finished a French tour, and he's a very big star in France and also in the Quebec area, so I'm aware of him, and I've met him a number of times. But he is one of those people like me who don't like pop music very much, who prefer to get into the more rock aspect and even deeper, more intellectual aspect, because there's an awful lot of people out there who buy records who are dissatisfied with the current state of affairs, with music, especially music coming from England these days. It's I like a record that I can really bite into and, and enjoy getting into a very clever production and... Um, interesting words. You know, I get the impression that too many people these days are not bothering too much about any kind of intellectual satisfaction for the listener. And I know that my head is interested in achieving that as, as, as I am. Somebody once said that that was what was so pleasing about the Beatles music, or even more specifically, in many cases, John Lennon's writing, because he could write a beautiful melody, the lyrics were simple, but there was something rough, raw, and from the heart that was being said in a song like In My Life, etc. You have that spirit there. It's nice to see that. Well, I think you can break music down into two fairly clearly defined areas. One of them is what appeals to the heart, and one of them appeals to the body. The physical music, and disco music is physical music. If you ask anybody, you know, what a particular disco song is about, it's impossible. You'd say, well, it's about rhythm, which is it, that's what it's for. And a lot of new wave style music is rhythmic music with, with um, nothing particularly satisfying for the heart. But I do like to combine the two. And it is more difficult to do that. It's very easy to set up your drum machine and work out an interesting and complex rhythmic song without bothering too much about whether some young lady is going to sit down at home and really listen into it and, and get some kind of satisfaction from listening to the words as well. Before I let you go, Chris, basic inspiration behind living on the island. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, John, it was when I went down to Greece uh, about a year ago with, with my wife. We had a wonderful holiday. I don't get a chance for a holiday very much. 
And when I do get a time off, I tend to spend it at home because I'm away from home so much. But we had a wonderful time on, on the island. And the island is a symbol of a place to escape from and a place to return to. It's almost like the home. And I wanted to just create this, a really good, warm, seat, seaside feeling of, of the events that one would see on an island, as well as the slightly deeper beings of the, the, the symbolism of an island. We all have islands of the mind, if you will. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Actually, even where peaceful waters flow, that takes us away a bit as well, doesn't it? Yes, that's a song which I had. I had a record one time which was a, a superb record, which was a, a mass sung in, in Creole in South America. And it's a most extraordinary, it doesn't strike me as being at all religious, it's just, it's very moving the way these hundreds of people sing. And, with, and the instruments they use are very ethnic instruments. And I wanted to get almost like a people's choir singing on that particular song. It is, um, it's, a, it's sort of a spiritual feeling about having peacefulness in one's life. So I'm not obsessed with you know, covering up my head and being happy and all that stuff. But that particular song, the way I wrote it, it seemed to come out in that way. About the tour, where do you begin? Do you start in Vancouver? No, we start in Calgary on Friday, and uh, we play the Edmonton Coliseum on the 9th, and on April 11th we play the Queen Anne Theatre in Vancouver. And then we go on from uh, from there, Saskatoon, Regina, Winnipeg, Toronto in the Maple Leaf Gardens, um, Ottawa, Montreal for Quebec City, right across to the uh, east coast of Canada. And then we go back into Europe. We've got a, a couple of... You probably find this quite interesting because you've heard of men at work, what's his name, uh, John yes. Cougar. Yes. People like that, they're all superstars over here. But I'm, I'm headlining a big festival in Germany, two, two days, and all these guys are supporting me. <laughs> quite interesting to find how things switch around. Yes, well, that often happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was like when uh, Men at Work toured with Metal as Anything supporting, and I understand in Australia it's the reverse. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, Don't Pay the Ferryman, of which we spoke, is now breaking in, in a very big way in America, and it looks likely that uh, finally the problem that I had of profile there is, is going to be out the window. Mm -hmm. I know the song did very well in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've always had good support here, and uh, we wish you good luck. be nice to see you on the 11th. All right, John. Good. All my best wishes to, to you and, and the workers and the listeners at CFMI. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, John. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.